Kiritato no Mahari Mai. I'd just like to welcome everybody here on behalf of the Rural General Practice Network and our partners in Crime Tonight Mobile Health New Zealand. Uh, we've, we've convened tonight's um, webinar because rural health is in crisis and we want to recognise that. The Health and Disability Systems Review recognised that crisis. There is a crisis in the health workforce that needs um, solving. There's a crisis in rural connectivity in terms of um, our rural um, colleagues being able to access telehealth solutions. There's a crisis in terms of um, the rural health outcomes. Rural people are just not getting the same rural outcomes that our um, other people in the cities are getting. So we want to address that. We want to hear tonight the plans that the various political parties have for solving this crisis, not in 10 years, not with um, uh, you know, plans that never get solved. We want to hear what's going to happen in the next three years and hopefully that will lead people to steer their vote in the right direction if they're so inclined. So I would just like to hand over to Nairi Kurs. Nairi is a rural born and bred person. She's a GP, worked um, in rural areas and now is employed by universities to um, drive research and um, policy in rural health. So Nairi, over to you and um, thank you very much Brad. yeah we're going to segue and I'm going to welcome you all thank you very much for coming what an opportunity so I'm a GP by background but I've been working in the universities for some good years and have a, a broad range of experience there and I'm not sure why the Rural General Practice Network asked me to come and uh, referee this fun fight today but I'm hoping that we'll have some very good discussions so I just like to introduce our speakers First, we have Chris Hipkins. Give us a wave, Chris. Chris is the Member of Parliament for Rimu Taka, Leader of the House and Minister of Education, Health and State Services. He's also the Minister responsible for Ministerial Services. We're also joined by Dr Shane Reti, who is Member of Parliament for Whangarei, Spokesperson for Health and Deputy Chair of the Health Select Committee. We have um, Jenny Marcroft here, who is the New Zealand First, List MP based in Rodney, spokesperson for health, broadcasting, human rights, ACC, conservation and the environment. And we are just awaiting Julianne, uh, the, the Honourable Julianne Genta, who is the Greens MP Minister for Women, Associate Minister of Health and Associate Minister of Transport. She will be joining us. She's just landing from a plane flight. So we uh, will just uh, welcome her when she comes. Now I'd like to give each of the politicians and I'll call the order, uh, five minutes to just give us your best. We are very keen to improve the lot of people of the populations in rural areas and we know there are some of your policies here but we'd like to give the opportunity to really just give them your best. I'd like to invite uh, Chris Hipkins to begin this and so I believe we'll have Chris Hipkins on the, on the screen and um, I'll give you five minutes Chris. Go for it. Thank you very much. And kia ora everybody. Wherever you are in the country, can I um, have exchange a very warm greeting to you. Um, I do want to acknowledge, too, uh, the work that you've been doing up and down the country around our response to COVID-19. It's been a challenge for everybody. It's been a particular challenge um, for the health system, of course. Um, and can I just um, extend a very warm thank you to you for the way that you have been fle uh, flexible, uh, adaptable, um, and have risen to the challenges that have been posed by COVID-19. I think um, the scale of change that we saw, the scale of innovation that we saw as a result of COVID-19 is a tribute to all of the people working in the system. Um, now, you'll be aware that this is, uh, this is not a portfolio that I have been in for a long time. Um, I'm only about three months into the health portfolio. I've um, been Minister of Education for the past three years. Uh, but reading through the materials, and of course, my, my focus primarily in health, um, has been really on that urgent COVID-19 response. But reading through the materials for tonight's meeting and um, reading, through, reading through your position paper, one of the thing that struck, things that struck me is how similar <clears throat> the issues facing rural healthcare are to the issues facing rural education. Funding models that work well in metropolitan areas but not so well in rural settings, um, an ageing workforce and a significant workforce challenge. Um, these are things that are in common with education in, the, in rural areas and ones that I think across government we need to have whole of government solutions um, to do a better job of addressing. 
Uh, the Labor Party released its health manifesto for 2020 today, um, and you'll see that that includes a significant ongoing focus on mental health and mental health support in schools, including in rural schools, um, and uh, increased funding to reduce waiting lists, increased funding for pharmac, increased funding for cochlear implants, uh, and improved dental care. One of the things that we've committed to was 20 additional mobile dental clinics. Um, and one of the areas we know that we've got more need uh, for dental services, particularly for young people, is in rural areas. And so one of the areas of that we'll be targeting those additional mobile dental clinics to are hard to reach areas, including rural communities. Just uh, speaking briefly to the manifesto that you have put forward, and I need to open a different document for that. Uh, the three things that you've identified in the manifesto, sustainable funding, uh, one that recognises the different costs of uh, providing health care in isolated and rural areas. Um, that is something that uh, a Labour government will certainly be working to address. Uh, the Health and Disability System Review identifies that as an issue that does need to be addressed, and that is something that we're committed to working with you to address. The workforce pipeline um, is your second priority area. That's something that we were working on leading up to COVID-19. That work did go on hold as a result of our response to COVID-19. It's coming back on stream now. Um, the Labour Party and the current government is committed to the idea of um, rural health professional hubs um, to, in order to um, upskill and, and, and increase our, our rural health workforce across the board, not just GPs, uh, but right across the board. Uh, including nurses, nurse practitioners, and so on. And the third area is digital uh, and connectivity. And again, there are some common themes here between health and education. One of the things that we've already done um, is move to make access to uh, health information online free of charge, rega regardless of who your uh, data provider is, regardless of who your internet service provider is. So if you're accessing COVID-19 information via the web, for example, um, the Ministry of Health is reimbursing the internet service providers for that access so that you will not have be charged that by your internet service provider. It won't come off your data allocation. That's a model that we're trialing, but we can see that being applied uh, across a much wider range of health information uh, and health services uh, where we pick up the tab for that so that uh, in those areas where access to the internet is more expensive, where we know it is in rural areas, um, we can help to meet the cost of that. We've got a big challenge around connectivity in rural areas um, and getting better connections uh, in rural areas. And that's something that we'll be working on as a government. Um, even in rural areas that are closely connected to urban areas, actually that's often where some of the worst connectivity takes place or is, is available. So I think of my own area, I'm in Upper Hutt, literally just across the hill in Whitemans Valley, which is a rural area, but right beside a, 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 an urban area, the internet connectivity there is terrible. Um, and you would think it would be uh, reasonably reasonably good, and it isn't. So we've got a lot. We've got a big challenge to do around just getting that internet connectivity in place. But we will absolutely do that, and then making sure that cost is not a barrier to accessing telehealth services. So that's that's my a brief introduction. I think I've stuck within the five Here's minutes, and five I'm minutes. Looking, forward to the, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Chris. That's uh, thank you for keeping to time. It's always, always, always welcome. Now we'd next like to welcome Jenny Marcroft to uh, to the screen to um, give us your five minutes worth, Jenny. Oh, thank you very much. Tēnā koutou katoa he mahana kia koutou. Very warm greetings to you all, wherever you may be around the country. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, join the our. Uh, my parliamentary colleagues here this evening to talk to you about our individual policies and also too I would also like to um, just acknowledge the work that this government has done um, in terms of having a health focus and as the health spokesperson I have been working very closely with the Labour Health Minister uh, the Honourable Chris um, Hipkins but prior to him also to David Clark so it's really been something I've been able to work um, in a really collegial way and I must actually extend that also to Dr Shane Bletty as the Deputy Chair of the Health Select Committee mm -hmm. uh, working too with Shane uh, has been a pleasure over the last three years. I'd like to acknowledge um, the work that our primary sector has done, particularly over COVID, and this is really echoing the words of the Minister. Um, 
we've had these extraordinary times and it really requires extraordinary people. And I would like to think our GPs are these indeed extraordinary people have really stepped up and provided a response that has been exemplary. But now really it's time to take stock of what's happened, uh, what we've learned during this time where we see a gap in our system, um, a gap, gap in our health services and what can we do as a government um, and as politicians to provide some solutions alongside you to fix these. Uh, and is it a model that that, um, is more community focused, moving away from the DHBs and having the money follow the patient. That's something that New Zealand First has been thinking about. Um, we really think that we do have a truly first world healthcare system, but, but really we need to main, maintain that that applies in the rural setting as well. Um, New Zealand First, we absolutely recognise that there are challenges in providing health care that's timely, that's affordable and provides equity of access for all, including our most vulnerable people. And no matter where they live, whether it's in the city, but particularly our distant rural communities, we know we don't have equity of access. And there are many challenges and it, and it really, um, I will sound like a crack record, these are um, particularly situations that you have found yourselves in, um, the high, highly variable delivery of healthcare services uh, will depend on regional circumstances. There are many difficulties that the general medical pra practices take, uh, have taking on new patients, um, they're already overloaded, uh, providing continuity of GPs to patients, practice nurses to patients um, with specific histories in particular. Um, we have access of the rural poor to healthcare and affordability of healthcare. And these are really um, areas that we believe need looking at and finding solutions for. Uh, the distances of travel to centres for specialist healthcare. Now that is a, a major challenge and we'd like to um, have a conversation about how could we establish um, a funding mechanism to significantly expand the mobile health services to bring uh, specialists and specialist services um, to those people in rural areas which have the largest distances to travel, particularly um, for areas like where my father is from in the Hokianga, very remote, rural, very poor area, um, and getting people to uh, services is very difficult. It's a challenge for them financially. If we can get those services moving into the community, um, they will have better health outcomes as a result. So such examples, as I mentioned, sounding like a bit of a scratch record for you, but we in New Zealand First, we've taken the view that there's uh, been a long trend of diminishing services, not just in healthcare. Um, the minister mentioned education as well. Um, basic social services in rural areas and New Zealand First has a record of um, making a noise about the post offices, particularly in rural areas, um, being reduced. And really, that is uh, unacceptable. Um, we have... Uh, we would like to consider, uh, it's not policy that we have released at the moment, but certainly would like to consider how do we attract more general practitioners to become rural GPs uh, and is a way of adequately funding the GP capitation formula to include a social determinant which would include rural isolation. This could be a possible solution that is well worth uh, considering and having a discussion about. And also too, maybe uh, DHBs taking responsibility to provide primary care staff rather than just the funding uh, mechanism, but actually providing the staff for rural practices with um, staffing uh, from urban and into rural GPs. That could be a mechanism to actually get physical bodies uh, rather than just the dollars into rural practice. Um, now you you're know, just on your time there, Jenny, one last comment. One last comment will really, um, thank you very much for the opportunity we have Particularly, I have many ideas on, on finding solutions, um, and these come directly from my family living in Pātea and the rural disconnect they have with healthcare providers. Um, they have formed much of my um, comments tonight. So thank you very much uh, for being thank here. Thank you very much, Jenny. We really appreciate those, um, those words. Now, Julianne Genta has, been, has managed to join us. Thank you very much, Julianne. I'm going to put you on the spot now. Um, so this is an opportunity for you to have five minutes to speak about the Greens policy with respect to rural health. And um, uh, you'll be the third person in the lineup to do that. And then you'll be followed by Shane, uh, by Shane Reddy from National. So I'd like to welcome you to the webinar. Thank you very much for joining us and hand over to you, Julianne. 
It's uh, wonderful to be able to speak to this forum this evening and apologies for joining late. My flight was very delayed back to Wellington. Um, for the Green Party, I will speak about rural health and its importance, but I just want to situate it in the larger context because so much of what affects people's health and well-being sits outside the health portfolio and for the Greens, we have six priority policies that we've got a lot of detail on on our website. Anyone can look at those. And those are really our top priorities for this election. In responding to COVID-19 in the next three years is really make or break for whether we respond effectively to climate change, which is one of the single biggest health risks to uh, the next generation and you know, following generations after that. So, uh, we see climate as something that has to be addressed through the COVID-19 response uh, in terms of investment in infrastructure that's going to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. And we also have an agriculture policy that's very focused on transforming agriculture to be really to support farmers to make a transition if they haven't already to uh, sustainable methods of agriculture that are looking after our waterways, that's building up the soil um, and that is looking after people's health as well, because we know that there are harmful health impacts over the long term from some of the practices that we've been using, you know, and potentially uh, high levels of nitrates in our waterways are, co are contributing to um, high bowel cancer rates in New Zealand. Um, that link hasn't been totally made yet, but it's incredibly likely. Um, and the other big factor that is affecting people's health that we have to address in order to address climate change, but also to uh, respond to COVID-19 is inequality. And so that's why we have a poverty action plan. We know that people who are living in cold, damp houses have greater health challenges uh, when they're struggling to make ends meet and kids are growing up in poverty. They are not able to attain their full potential. They're much more likely to have health issues. And so we really have to address that. And that's going to, we can do it, but it will take a pretty substantial transformation of our welfare system, of housing, our housing. Uh, we need government to step in and make sure that there's enough healthy housing available to people and that it's affordable. And so all the detail of how we can address all of that is on our, on our website. Ultimately, the, the things laid out in the Rural Health Manifesto, we can absolutely agree with. And the biggest challenge to delivering that, in my mind, is limited government revenue. And so this is where I come back to tax reform and our poverty action plan. New Zealand is a country that has enough for everyone, but because for the last 20 or 30 years, we have uh, prioritized letting those who have the most acquire even more um, because our tax system is not as progressive as it could be in as many countries that we would like to compare ourselves to is, uh, we've missed that opportunity to invest in the infrastructure and health services that will really look after our people and allow everyone in New Zealand to thrive. And that will, you know, that pays dividends over time. So we can't really address, and I, I know most of the other major parties, are, you know, either standing on a platform of tax reduction um, or of a very, very, very tiny tweaks um, to the income tax brackets, that's not going to cut it. Uh, we actually need to address um, the issues around uh, wealth, you know, wealth accumulation because we don't have a capital gains tax. And so people who have a lot of wealth, a lot of property, their wealth increases faster than the economy. And that's why we're proposing a very um, reasonable wealth tax, uh, which would only apply to the top 6% of New Zealanders, but it would raise substantial revenue for government to be able to address the very issues that you've laid out in your rural health manifesto. And I think any party that's promising to do that without saying how they're gonna pay for it and all of the other things we need to pay for in our health system and our education health system to address um, housing, the housing crisis, um, isn't really being honest with you. So. That's why I'd say a party vote for the Greens is a vote for a party that has well thought through policy, that is values based, and has proven to be a very constructive um, partner in this government. 
Um, as Associate Health Minister, I've had to deal with a range of things. Yeah, yeah you're on your last uh, few seconds there, uh, Julianne. I promised to interrupt people when they got to five minutes. Last comment. Um, well, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions and wanted to just congratulate all of the rural GPs for how much they helped both um, in the response to measles, but especially the flu vaccines. And I know that was frustrating for many people and we're working on a solution to that. They did a lot for COVID too, I think, in my experience. So thank you very much, Julianne. That's fantastic. So now we'll invite um, Dr. Shane Ritty to the, uh, to the, to the Zoom, uh, Zoom room and um, give you your five minutes. Thank you very much, Shane. Thank you, Nairi. Uh, kia ora mai tato. Uh, my name is Shane Reddy, MP for Provincial Whangarei, and it's a pleasure to uh, talk and focus on health, an area we clearly need to do better. And I would look back if I wanted to validate that and say, in 2017, we handed across to an incoming government six national health targets. This was people who were waiting less than six hours in A&E. There were 4,000 extra surgeries that were being done. Cancer treatment was happening in that faster cancer treatment, 62-day time frame. The eight-month immunizations were at a high, so that was a six-week, three-month, and five-month. People were being offered quit smoking advice, and the preschool obesity in children, the before-school check, uh, was to target as well. Every single one of those targets is worse today than when we handed them over in 2017, which is a puzzle because the Labour government has actually put more money into health across several areas, actually. And so I'm left with this dilemma of more money, worse outcomes, which probably needs some, some explanation. We clearly have different priorities amongst the group here, and we clearly have different priorities from Labour as well. When they came in in their first 100 days, their 200-day priorities for health were a mental health inquiry. I agree with that. That did actually need to be done. And the second was cannabis reform. And I'm sorry, but I just can't accept cannabis reform as the second most important health issue for the New Zealand health system. So we've actually got a detailed uh, section on rural health in our health manifesto. Uh, yes, there are general parts of health that apply, but rural health is special and specific, and I address it specifically. There are seven points across two main portfolios. I'll just go over uh, them briefly here. First of all, we'll put out a request for tender, a third rural medical school focused at retaining GPs in rural environments. We know that if you train and develop social networks in a rural environment, you're much more likely to stay there. Secondly, we'll progress digital technical solutions uh, for rural areas, that is, we'll extend RBI, and you've heard several other uh, people on this, uh, this Zoom call talk about that. It's very hard to do analytics, quantify and associate funding with rural environments if we don't data tag and data capture rural activities. And so I'm very enthusiastic to look at how we explore that how we might uh, look at some of the models that have been done overseas, Queensland, for example, data tagging, data capturing, what's actually happening in rural environments. I'm a big fan of supporting rural point of care testing. Uh, I did uh, think there were merits in what the Waitamata and Auckland were doing a year or two ago in rural point of care testing. That's the troponin T. I think it was D-dimer, uh, full blood count hemoglobin, full blood count white blood cells. I think those were the sort of things that were being done in the trial. I think there was real merits in that. And in our health manifesto, I'm enthusiastic to expand that. A rural health plan, we need a plan. We, we need a pathway to know where we're going, what our objectives are, are we reaching our objectives? Uh, rural suicide on Monday, I announced, well yesterday actually, down in Christchurch, uh, I announced with Matt Ducey, $16 million for RANS uh, to work on rural suicide. And uh, in our primary care uh, manifesto, in the, the bigger part of the health manifesto, I've put aside $200 million for a primary care navigator. Now, there are parts of the health manifesto that I've speed up, slowed down, added more money to, but this really changes the dial. So imagine in, in those primary care teams that are on the call here tonight, where I'm saying to you that we will add a social worker type person that I'm calling a navigator to your primary care team, roughly one for every 5,000 people. Think of what you could do with those arms and legs available to you in the primary care team. Oh, and by the way, like many of you, I worked with exactly this model in the NHS, and we quickly found that while we thought we were the most important as the locums, in fact, it was the social worker and the breadth and range of things they could do. 
So we've actually put aside $200 million for the primary care navigator, and this will change the dial on primary care. This will change the dial on rural practice. So across a range of dimensions, our health manifesto is quite detailed around specifically what we would do for rural health. And uh, we like to think that we understand rural health, not just inside health, but inside uh, other domains as well. And uh, we're putting this forward as our, as our health manifesto, and I'm very proud to do so. Okay, thank you very much, Shane, for being on time. You notice I didn't even have to interrupt you, so well done. Okay, so now we'd like to enter into a series of questions, and the first few questions will be yes or no answers. And so I'm just going to ask you a little bit of context and then the question, then each of you to either agree or not agree with the question. So I want to just point out to you that uh, the rural population is 700,000, right? So that's our second largest city. It's almost as many as the people over 65 in the, in the next coming years. So um, that's another area of my interest. But the, so these 700,000 are not doing so well. There are inequities. There is... Um, you know, a need for development and investment. One of the areas where most people have been concerned about is accountability. So one of the ways to address accountability is to, is to develop, maybe to develop a directorate for rural health. So will your party or are your, will you sign up to a directorate for rural health within the Minister, when Ministry of Health in the next government? So I'll ask you first, Shane Ritchie, yes or no? Yeah, no, that's not in our health policy manifesto. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, Julianne, is that, uh, could you sign up to that? Um, potentially. Potentially? <laughs> uh, we don't, I mean, I'd have to, I think it's probably a good idea is what I would say. Uh, Chris? <laughs> uh, not necessarily. No, okay, thank you. And Jenny? We'd certainly have a conversation. Okay, so there's another two maybes and two no's. Okay, not doing so well here, Grant. Okay, so then let's talk about the funding formula. We've heard one person uh, talk about the funding formula already and how it does need to be adjusted to recognise the delivery costs of rurally, the, the um, low volume dispersed populations uh, is more costly. So uh, uh, Shane, I think it was you that mentioned that the funding formula is up for grabs. Can I ask the rest of you whether that's a yes or no, whether you will revise the funding formula specifically to include some um, uh, recognition of for rural people? Julianne first. I do think that the funding formula needs to be looked at and the data that's used for it, but I think that's... Okay. So is that a yes or a no? Uh, yes. Okay, Chris. Well, yes, and, and I think the health and disability system review certainly commits us to doing that. Okay, good. And Jenny? Yes, that would uh, be likewise as well. Okay, good support for this. And Shane, can you just confirm that? Yeah, yeah, this is where we need to be specific. So everyone here presumably okay. is talking about PBFF and the rurality adjusters and the socio-demographic -demo adjusters. Let's remember rural health is also funded from prime funding, SIA funding, ACC yes. rurality. So all of these uh, can, can be adjusted to, uh, to better improve the viability of, of rural medicine. But to answer your first question, yes. Okay. Now, we're all aware of the workforce, uh, workforce problems that we're having. There's not, an, there's not enough people in the right places. Some say we have enough doctors, some say we don't. But we do not have enough allied health, nursing, qualified staff in rural areas. And there are many waiting to come to New Zealand from outside. So one of the barriers to those people coming is the costs, the charges for the managed isolation. Will you, should you become um, uh, in a situation where you can choose this, agree to waive the charges for MIQ for essential health workers who are needed in New Zealand rural areas? Shane, first, no. yes or no? No. Okay, Jenny. Um, I don't, we don't have policy on that. Um, okay, that's a maybe then, maybe. Chris. <laughs> uh, look, I'm not in a position to make that commitment, th those sorts of commitments tonight. Okay. I'd certainly be happy to look at it, but, but I can't make a commitment on that. Okay, another maybe, and Julianne? Same answer as Chris. Okay, cool. Okay, so perhaps too specific a question. So connectivity is one of the digital and con uh, one of the three mainstays of the manifesto that the, the um, rural uh, GP networks put together. So one of those connectivity things is broadband, and we've heard National talk a little bit about the RBI. So RBI is not specifically targeted for health, 
But one thing that would be very useful for all practices in the rural area is to be guaranteed to have high-speed broadband. Is this part of the guarantees in the, in the health policies for, let's start with Shane. Yeah, that's why, that's why I commented that we have progress in digital technology. So you could, uh, I mean, I'm not, I can't say to you tonight that I would specifically give broadband to every practice. Uh, but right. what I am saying is that uh, we're very enthusiastic to prioritise them at a very high level. Yep. And Chris, as we're getting all those uh, broadband to the schools in rural areas, we have a couple of little, uh, uh, um, little uh, branches to the general practices. No, that's right. I think if you look at the last Labour government, worked very hard to get broadband to every school in the country. Um, and I think it is a reasonable ask to say that, you know, health practices should also have access to yep. broadband. If we can get it to schools, we should be able to get it to health practices as well. Okay, excellent. Um, and Jenny? Well, as, you know, COVID has shown us, um, virtual consults have been a big part of, of how um, doctors have engaged with their clients pretty much. So it would make sense that we have uh, digital connectivity into all rural areas. You know, the government um, has done a lot already, 50 million for the, to further the rural broadband digital connectivity and particularly of note. Now, um, I'm just waiting for supposed to be yes or no answers, so I'll just have to try to stick to that if I can. Why so, are yeah. really important to be connected as well because they are health hubs uh, for yep. rurally isolated Māori communities, particularly in the north. Um, we have put 21 million into that this year. Julianne. Uh, yes, and again, a good ex, you know, example of why government needs more revenue to be able to invest in infrastructure and services like that. Okay, thank you very much. So I'd just like to direct the, um, the discussion now, so this is now a discussion, to the area of workforce development. So we've heard two firm plans from Labour and National, one for hubs, one for a third uh, medical school. So I just wanted to ask, and this question comes in several parts. The first part is about timing. So how soon could the, a strategy uh, actually deliver allied health doctors, nurses to rural areas in greater numbers? Shane, would you like to go first? Timing. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go out to RFP in the first 100 days. So we did some work with this. Uh, Bill English had progressed this substantively. Uh, I have provisional business cases in my hands now, so uh, we, we, we so won't have time to get to the right. Because they start training, it takes, what, four or six years, depending on the program, and no, then not, they've got to do not, their not, rural general practice training, and then, so what not, are you talking about here? No, not if it's a graduate medical school. Uh, in my hands, it'll be a graduate medical school following the Flanders and Queensland model, uh, some of the Canadian models. You will turn up at med school as a long, And then you have the specialist training in general practice or rural hospital medicine. So how long? Right. And, and, and all of that in a rural environment. That's, that's the magic, that people are trained and stay in those rural environments. Okay, so good. Timing a little bit longer, but good potential good outcome. Chris, would you like to speak to that? The timing yeah, of the... With an, with an additional medical school is it only deals with one part of the, the, the jigsaw puzzle here. There's actually a whole rural professional health workforce that we need to think about, including nurses, nurse practitioners, everybody else uh, that's involved in that process. And we need to create more opportunities to earn and learn at the same time. So more in-work learning opportunities in rural settings. So that's why the Health Hubs, I think, has real merit about it, because it can deal with, with all aspects of the health workforce. So I want to see those up and running as soon as we can. Okay, so we've been writing bids about that for more than three years, Chris, so I just want to challenge you a little bit. How soon will they actually come to pass? Um, look, as you'll be aware, there was, a, there was a strand of work being undertaken by the Ministry of Health. It did get stopped because of COVID-19. It's back on track now. Um, I'd expect to see um, the recommendations or, you know, the, the final kind of, if you like, action plan arising from that by the end of this year. Okay, thank you. Now, Julianne? I don't have anything more to add other than what Chris has just said. And Jenny. I'd just like to add, following on from what Chris was saying, that it's really important that we get people, um, so that we're not just getting city kids learning to be doctors. We need to make sure and provide a pathway for our rural students to become general practitioners, because we know that if uh, you you learn and you know from you from the area that you come from, you're more likely to stay or go back to your home area, which is the right. rural community. So that's a really important uh, pathway. 
Great. Okay, so um, from one of my rural colleagues who lives in a small town, so with the investment in rural workforce training, I'd like you to be specific about where that investment will be invested. Will it be invested in bricks and mortar in um, big cities? Will it be invested in rural communities to aid um, economic development there? Shane? Well, uh, obviously an RFP will determine where that is, but by virtue of the fact that we said you will train in rural environments, it'll be in rural environments. Okay, and Chris? Well, I think the model that I've just spoken about, the, you know, the hubs model is about um, learning, in, learning in practice, learning, learning on the job, um, learning in rural communities. Um, that's absolutely what we want to see. So new money might actually be directed to be spent in the rural communities. Is that the idea? I think there's good support for that idea from this side of the table. Absolutely. Okay, so um, there is a, a push on getting more people into primary care in rural areas. So now we've got uh, HIPS from uh, the Labour government. We've got the navigators who are coming from national government. We've got rooms which actually can't accommodate training needs for registrars and medical students. So how do we manage this? Will there be the potential for expanding the uh, real estate, if you like, or the capacity and infrastructure to, to um, uh, allow these extra people into the rural health workforce? Don't all interrupt at once. Who wants to go first? Reckon there too. Okay, look, that's, you know, you're absolutely right. Sometimes it sounds great to increase the number of uh, training registrars, but sometimes the rate limiting factor is actually them having their own consultation room, surprisingly enough, the bricks and mortar. We found that up here in Northland. Uh, to answer the question, do we have any particular policies around that? I'd have to say I don't, Nari. I'm, I'm aware of the problem. Uh, we see it here in Northland, but I don't have any particular imperatives to answer it just here at the moment. Okay. Anyone else want to take a hazard, a hazard, a comment about that? Well, one of the things that I, I do want to comment on, because it links the two big portfolios that I hold of health and education, uh, we know that schools can, can play a bigger role, you know, in terms of providing facilities, a place, um, for a variety of other services to be delivered. We've got a number of rural schools, for example, with empty classrooms that can be converted for use for other things, including for the provision of health services. I mean, that's a lot cheaper than building something new. And those, those small rural schools are often the heart of their local communities already. So I think there's real potential for us to think a bit holistically in terms of, you know, all of the different things government's providing in rural communities. Um, let's go to where the people are. Um, and let's say, how can we do a better job of joining things up around the needs of families? Um, and, and I think that, you know, linking up health and education provides real potential there. Look, I think there could be some merits there, Nari, but you and I have been mentors and we understand the reality is you have your mentor in the room next door to your trainee and they go along seven tenths of the time and then the, the three tenths, they say, oh, look, Shane, I'm not too sure about this. What do you think? So you have to be in close. That's the reality of the workflow there. So there, there could be opportunities there. Chris could be right, but we also need to understand the workflow of training trainees. Yeah, Julianne or Jenny? Chipping in? Okay. So um, another idea with the workforce development is that the rural communities themselves have very good ideas about what they want. Uh, is anybody uh, willing to take that step to be quite innovative and, if, and uh, do something completely new and allow the rural communities to be a very strong part of the, of the development of the workforce? And that might be that they may choose how they want to uh, have their trainees come and do things. They might choose to contract with some things from some medical schools or from other medical schools. Is it an open book for, the, for these uh, hubs? Is it an open book for the uh, new medical school? This is a collaboration between the medical schools and the community. So I'm not in a position to set the training requirements. Uh, that's a requirement that's actually accredited offshore every few years. So totally amenable for that discussion to be between the medical school, what the training requirements are, and the rural community as to how they might have some flexibility with some of them or how they might deliver some and not others. Uh, totally happy for that discussion to be, and to facilitate that discussion. But at the end of the day, uh, it is the requirements that the medical school has to train that needs to be met. Okay, thank you. Any further? Well, one of the things that I, 
one of the things I find challenging about a third medical school proposal is just the very quantum of money that goes into bricks and mortar. Um, it, it is hugely expensive in terms of what you have to build in order for there to be a third medical school. And I'm not convinced if you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars um, designed to increase the supply of GPs, that that's going to be the best bang for buck you could get from that money. So, uh, you know, I, I do believe in the hubs. I think that it's a good concept. I do I acknowledge, I absolutely acknowledge, we need more rural GPs. I'm just not convinced that creating a whole other medical school with the enormous investment that goes into building capital um, is the best way of achieving it. And so this is why we go to RFP and why I have the indicative business cases in front of me to explain and look at exactly these sort of cost-benefit ratios. Okay, thank you. That's, that's good discussion. Yes. The, the real need to listen to the voice of the community. New Zealand First, we're very much a party of the provinces and we go out and listen to the community and I think that has to be uh, part of the equation of deciding where these um, medical training hubs or any kind of uh, workforce development needs to happen is to be directed in consultation with the community. Okay, good. We just changed, um, changed the topic a little bit to access issues for rural people. So some people have done, uh, Gary Nixon did a great study showing that when you put a CT scanner in a rural area, you immediately reduce that disparity in access to uh, advanced diagnostics. Can I have your comment on how you might increase access to diagnostics in rural areas? We've um, got some ideas about buses, but that's for dental care. We've got some ideas about other things. So um, how would you increase access to diagnostics for rural communities? Now think broadly here, not just the CT scanner, but all of the other diagnostic things that are needed um, to deliver a, a, a 20th, 21st century health service. So, Noah, you heard me talk about point of care testing uh, already and the uh, Auckland White and uh, trials and the enthusiasm I have so much so that I put it in the manifesto uh, for more diagnostics to go out uh, into primary care. I think, secondly, there's a discussion around uh, the governance of diagnostics, not just in rural communities, uh, but also in metropolitan communities, because I think there needs to be some discussion around uh, what is required for GPs to be able to order a CT scan, whether you're rural or metropolitan. So the, the governance of diagnostics, the decision making, uh, I think that discussion is well overdue. And I think uh, rural communities, particularly because of their distance from the machines, um, should be a, a, a significant voice in that dialogue. It's quite complex, isn't it? Because um, uh, there's a workforce that goes with the diagnostics is the ultrasonographer who drives the ultrasound to do the pregnancy ultrasounds. So it's not just the machine, but if you can't, don't have the machine, then uh, nothing can happen. Great. Jenny or uh, Julianne, any comment? And then Chris. Uh, really, we've just, um, in terms of thinking, it's, it's around taking those services by a bus out into the community. Um, and particularly, um, you know, you have mentioned that dental. We've seen a really good example of that up in the north. In the Hokianga, we've had the dental services go through um, and made a huge difference to our um, isolated rural community. So that, that's a concept that could be developed further and we could take diagnostics out through um, the communities in, in that manner. Okay, thank you. As Associate Health Minister, I did a lot of work on primary maternity services, which resulted in the single biggest increase in funding for primary maternity services. And uh, one of the um, immediate things that we changed was increasing the amount that was available to midwives who are working rurally. Um, and I think that what I've found throughout my time in this position is that we can't get away from the issue of government revenue being constrained when we want to provide better services out there in the community. I've no doubt that there are ways to do it cost effectively and in ways that beneficially um, improve the community and the economy out there in the provinces and in the rural areas. Um, but um, when we're just trying to catch up on making up for the underfunding of the health system over the last 10 years. Um, okay. It's extremely yeah. difficult to see how we can get that uh, machinery and the people who can work it out there to the rural areas because we also yeah. have urban areas where there are extremely high levels of deprivation as well. Yep, yeah. agreed. Chris, comment. 
Yeah, look, I, I agree with um, Julianne's comment there. We, we cannot provide all things to all people in all places at all times. Um, there will, there will, you know, on occasion be the need to travel to access some services. But I'm open to having that conversation about if there are commonly used or common demand for diagnostics that could be more readily available in rural areas, then I'm very open to that conversation. Just uh, fielding our questions on this end. Thank you very much for that comment. Good discussion. So there's quite a bit of uh, uh, questions coming through about the areas we've been discussing. One of them is about if we need greater workforce or more people, is it better to and much more quicker to get those people from overseas? Um, so should we? Is that part of a, a solution to the workforce problems? Overseas graduates, experienced people, I hit the ground running versus growing our own. Comments on that, on that, please. Well, can I, can I answer that, yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. question in two parts, perhaps, um, and say that the answer is actually both. So often it's a short-term solution to bring more skilled people in from abroad to fill the school, skill shortages that we have, um, and we have been doing that, and we're going to need to continue to do that, but we also need to do a better job of training our own. So I don't think it's either or, but I think when you're talking about training your own, you do have to recognise that there's lead times involved in that. Now, I, um, I noticed in the comments on the right-hand side of my screen, someone uh, talking about, you know, the cost of managed isolation. You're only talking about $3,000 in the grand scheme of things. That's actually quite cheap. I didn't say that we wouldn't do it. I just said I'm not in a position to make that commitment. And that does need to be considered um, in the context of the huge demand that we've got um, for people to come across the border. So it's not just the $3,000 cost that's the barrier here, it's that we've got a limited capacity um, for managed isolation, and we do need to ration those places in managed isolation. Um, and I'm not, I, I would never say that health shouldn't be in the queue for an allocation of that. I absolutely think it should be, um, but I just can't make specific commitments on that tonight. But then what, why are we not increasing the capacity of managed isolation? Uh, that would be, seem to be the solution rather than the bottleneck. Well, uh, well, and just to come back to your first point, I, I agree with you. I, th I think you're right. We need our IMGs. 50% of our workforce are our IMGs while we're growing, growing our own doctors who, who just do a better job. You know, they, yeah, they get better, better, they do a better I job. Do, I do think we're not talking about very many people. So it doesn't seem like that much of a barrier that managed That's right. Look, But there's a process that we're going through at the moment of prioritising those additional workforces where there might be small numbers with very high value. And how can we prioritise those and get them into the country as quickly as we can? Uh, but we've also got people, bear in mind, who were here on work visas. Um, they, their home is here because they were working here. They were out of the country when the lockdown you know, of the border began. Um, and for the last six months, they haven't been able to come home um, because they're not a New Zealand resident or a citizen. Um, and in fairness to them, we have to provide some prioritisation for them too. Shane's point about why don't we just have more managed isolation places, uh, it's, not it's not that simple. As you've seen, these are quite complex things to stand up. It's not just a question of having a hotel and putting people in it. You've got to have the health workforce um, that's associated, that, that's able to do that. And I do want to just make the obvious point, Shane, and you will know this, we're struggling to get health professionals willing to work in those facilities at the moment because of the negative publicity that's associated with them. Mm. So you okay. could help with that by not contributing to that negative publicity. Oh, well, okay, the, so, we'll do a good so job there and there won't be negative publicity. We all acknowledge publicity. everybody wants to get back in. We'll just redirect you back to rural health issues now. Um, so I'd like to hear your views. What is the role and purpose of our rural hospitals? Let's start with Jenny. Well, I'll just take an example of Hokianga Health. Um, I do refer back to uh, where my dad is from because they have uh, an area that's, you know, deeply deprived, um, but they are doing an amazing work in terms of healthcare at, at that local hospital. And they are critical to all of the people that, um, that come to, to their hospital. They do incredible work. So absolutely the need for hospitals like, like that uh, all so around. What, what will you do about making sure that those rural hospitals are solid, that they are supported, that they can vie for funds within their DHBs and, and actually be a leading force within the, within, the rural, within the health sector? Well, I think we've got the Health and Disability Review, and I think that will, um, once that is shaken down in, in more detail after the election, I think there will be uh, an emphasis on those types of hospitals, making sure they get an equal share of the pie. Okay, Shane? 
Yeah, no, of course, there's a place for rural hospitals. In fact, tying back to a previous question, I was just reflecting, I took my first x-ray, and probably, thankfully, for the greater people of New Zealand, the only one I've ever taken at Rawini Hospital uh, when I was on call there, actually. Uh, but look, in, in my view, uh, rural hospitals, their role is to assess, uh, resuscitate, uh, stabilise, and then probably transfer. I, I, th I think that's the functionality that you need at rural hospitals. Some, like Rawini, are able to have inpatient beds for stable patients, or some coming back from a, a secondary or tertiary a hospital, a base hospital, where they can recuperate better in their community. So it does have those roles as well. But I, think so, some Dan, I, think, I think we've got 52 rural hospitals around New Zealand, and 26 of them deliver the full gamut of acute services. They have inpatient wards. They have certain, uh, you know, reasonably advanced diagnostics. And you've got places like Kaitaia, which um, they do regular surgery and have an anaesthetist on site. So there, you know, I, you know, let's consider those rural hospitals a little bit more. Can they become a, a much more viable part of our rural health service? Oh, they can, but we struggle, as you well know, to get workforce up to Kaitaia. Um, I remember when I was on the DHB there, it was a mission then, and I imagine it's a mission now for, for any number of reasons. So this is a, a, an admirable um, desire, if you like, but harder to actually implement because I've been part of trying to do that. Just saying. Well, I have to say, I think the Pukawakawa program has uh, delivered a series of uh, house surgeons up there that they're really having a good time. But yes, okay, thank you. Julianne, any comment? Rural hospitals. I'm going to sound like a broken record, but uh, the Green Party absolutely supports us properly funding our health system so that people can have accesses, access to the services that they need. And uh, we can do that if we have progressive taxation. The other thing is that, um, I mean, the Greens really favor uh, a more decentralized model. I think generally, like decisions should be made at the level at which they affect people. And so that's why I, I think that we would like to see through the health and disability system review. There are opportunities, of course, for um, doing things more efficiently, but uh, we don't want that efficiency to then uh, be cutting off uh, those opportunities for people out in rural areas. So I think that there's a balance there. Okay, and Chris? Yeah, look, I actually, I, far be it for me to agree with Shane, but I do actually think that Shane's got a valid point here. Um, that, that uh, it's not always easy to staff um, small rural hospitals with all of the staffing that you might need. We do have to be reasonable in our expectations that there are going to be cases where sort of stabilise and transfer is the right, is the right such, you know, position for rural hospitals to be in um, because that's, that's the best patient, that's the best option for the patient. That's the best way to provide them with the best quality health care. Um, and I do think we have to, you know, be, be honest with people um, that in many cases that's going to be what we need to do. Okay, thank you very much. Well, we're coming up to the last five minutes. So I'd like to give you all one minute just to summarise. Uh, wait a minute, I've got one last question. How will you create an integrated rural health plan Ensure that and ensure that the government is accountable. Integrated rural health plan and accountability. Shane, you go first. Yeah, I think I mentioned this in my introduction. I'm looking at my point notes here. Point ten, point five, a rural health plan. Like I said, we need we need a pathway. Uh, what are the objectives? What is the time frame? What are the accountabilities? And uh, we would look to be bringing up a rural health plan uh, clearly from the ground up with the involvement with all the key stakeholders really early in our first term if we're privileged to be government. Chris? Yeah, I think it's a collaborative and consultative process. We have been engaged with that around the workforce needs for, for the rural health workforce. I think we need to expand that out to a wider consideration of, you know, what are all of the health needs in the rural communities that extend beyond the workforce. Um, so <laughs> no problem with committing to a, a collaborative process around that. I'm waving your policy at you, Chris, because I just read this policy and the word rural does not actually appear in it. Um, and you also have this document here, which is the Rural Proofing Guide, which I think actually was borrowed from National Started That. Um, and so these two things are there, but there's still no mention of rural health in your rural and your health policy. Well, that's because it's covered in the rural policy. So have a look at how, keep an eye out for that one. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> Julianne and then Jenny. Um, I, I actually don't have a lot to add. I, I think that it's really, other than, you know, it's important that government has the resources needed to make sure that we can not only write a plan like this in collaboration with people living out in rural areas, but actually implement it. Okay, and Jenny. 
we know over a period of years that there is actually a poverty of, of investment in rural healthcare, and it's most definitely urgently required to address the situation. We need to stop the health postcode lottery. We need to make good on our promise of better, sooner and more convenient health services for our rural communities. Okay, that's great. Now we just have a, uh, two or three minutes uh, left. We were a little bit late starting. So I'll just give you one minute each just to sell to your voters why they should give your party either their party vote or their um, candidate vote. So let's start with Jenny. Oh, thank you very much. New Zealand First, we are a party of the provinces. We have demonstrated this through the $3 billion provincial growth fund. We've had our focus for the last three years on what we can do to uplift our rural communities. And so our focus now must shift to what can we do to uplift health in our rural communities. So giving your party vote to New Zealand first, you will get a spotlight shone on the equity of health for all New Zealanders, particularly those in rural isolated areas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Chris Hipkins. I think the Labour Party has demonstrated in government that we're willing to put our money where our mouth is in terms of health. Um, we do acknowledge that the health system was overstretched, overburdened when we became the government, and we've been working very hard to catch up with that. Uh, we haven't been able to solve every problem overnight, but we've been willing to look at the big issues, the systemic issues that sit underneath some of that. And you'll see through the health and disability review and the fact that we're accepting the recommendations and broadly accepting the recommendations of the review, still a lot of work to go around that, that we are willing to take on that big challenge of getting underneath some of these problems and actually uh, making sure that we're addressing them for the long term, as well as just, the, as, you know, not just putting short term band aid solutions over the top of problems that are becoming bigger and bigger by the day. Thank you. And Julianne Ginter. Um, COVID-19 has shown us that when we work together, uh, when we listen to the evidence and when we're kind, we can actually achieve quite good outcomes. And we need to support our people to be able to continue responding to this challenge over time. But the next three years for government are make or break in terms of our ability to respond to climate change. And we must address the fundamental inequality that still exists in our society that has uh, you know, started with colonization, but it got a lot worse in the 90s. And the Green Party will be a staunch voice for the environment, for climate, and for taking practical action on inequality so that we can continue to thrive together as a country. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Shane Reefy. Thank you. Look, the, the National Party has a solid track record supporting rural communities, and, and we'll do more. A vote for National is a vote to tighten up the border. Vote for National is a vote for tax cuts, jobs and health targets, not tax rises, cannabis and a public holiday. We understand health, we understand rural communities, and we're looking for your support. Okay, thank you very much. Well, that was a good place to end. I just need to um, uh, say a couple of things. So the questions that have been on the chat that were not answered, uh, the Rural General Practice Network will theme them up and send them to our uh, panelists here for a brief response and, and uh, communicate that back to participants. So thank you very much. They will not be ignored. We'd like to offer the recording of this webinar will be available. We've got Bob in the background here from Mobile Health. It will be on the Mobile Health website. So that's mobilehealth.co.nz. Look under the education tab for webinars and you will be able to find this and watch it as many times as you like. Um, and I'd like to just end by thanking the Rural General Practice Network for starting off this initiative. And of course, our, our sincere thanks to their four panellists, Dr. Shane Reethy, uh, Honourable Julianne Genter, Honourable Chris Hipkins and Honourable Jenny Marcroft for coming along and sharing their thoughts with us. And together, I agree with you, we can make a difference to rural health, but we're at the beginning of it not at the end. So we'll uh, say thank you very much and we'll end the webinar there. Thanks, Nari. Thanks, Grant. <laughs>